Good morning and welcome to the Standing Committee's meeting for Wednesday, October 9th, 2024. All council meetings will be live streamed on the city's website and for guest speakers who join us at the table, please do not turn your microphones off. Our first order of business is roll call. Will the clerk please take the roll? Mr. Charlin. Here. Mr. Coghill. Ms. Gross. Here. Mr. Lavelle. Mr. Mosley. Here. Mrs. Kel Smith. Ms. Warwick. Here. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Strasburger, Chair. Here. Five members present. Thank you. Our next order of business is public comment. I would like to remind all speakers that the rules of council state that comments are limited to matters of concern, official action, or deliberation, which are or may be before city council. Profanity will not be permitted. Please state your name and neighborhood for the record. You will have three minutes to speak. There being no registered speakers, we will take uh, comments from those in the audience wishing to speak. First speaker, please. Okay, my name is Yvonne F. Brown. Um, I'm a little bit. Okay, I have these, my posters that I make. And I was showing here how you have the president, you're one that's running, Trump that's running for president, and they all, oh, he held his hand up. Oh, praise him. When you have three, you have the two black men that won the Olympics. And they put their hands up in the air. They took their medals away. They won for the United States. But when they put their hands up in the air, they took the medals away. Now, because he got cut on his ear, and some say it was a piece of glass. I don't know what it was, but I, they made that big bandage on his ear, and he's such a brave man. You know what? Trump and the rest of you better think about it. The chickens are coming home to roost. It wasn't a black man that tried to kill him. It was one of you that tried to kill him. Him. And then you, then you got him praising the, 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 uh, the men that are supposed to watch him. Anytime the people are trying to say there's somebody up there, and even your officials, your FBI, and all of them supposed to protect him, they, they must have wanted him to die too because they didn't try to protect him. Also, I just wanted to say that they play the race game. If I say it, oh, it's a race game. Now look, look how dark they done made Kamala. She looked like a black woman. She looked darker than me. And she's a light-complected woman. Look, I want you to see this is how they play the race game. They make her like she's the villain. Look how she looked like she could be the villain. And him with his orange, ancient orange color. He, he's smiling. But I do want to say this, that I come down here every day because I feel that you don't listen to me. You don't. But you have people calling me and saying, Yvonne, keep going down. Anytime Jim Furlow, you know, he was something. He told me. August Wilson told me to keep coming down. Even John DeFazio, the little wrestler that had been the president of council, he, when he walked out before he died, he was on crutches. He's going to have an operation. And he had came up to, up to Kaylee Irvis. And when he did, he came and said, come, Miss Brown, walk with me. He walked with me with his arm in the crutch, and he said, Miss Brown, keep going down and speaking out. Now, that was a rough and gruff little man, and he had treated me so bad when I told his wife, and I love her, because she said, you did He said, oh, no, 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 he tried to explain. Let me tell you something. You are given much, much to do for us. You're given much honor, praise. You even get paid to come twice a week when most of you don't come. I was, I wish Dr. Miller, I miss Dr. Miller. When we talk about who should be mayor, and you just don't understand Dr. Miller. And you just, oh, okay, but he should be mayor. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Well, good morning. My name is Howard H.P. Jackson. Black Political Empowerment Project. Grew up with NACP all my life in Pittsburgh. I was reflecting about the epics of Willie Lynch uh, strategy to develop fear from the 1700s and it interacted in American black minds of fear. All right. 
Now, let me go ahead with the episodes. I already mentioned about 1857, March the 6th, uh, Supreme Court acknowledged it like we wasn't Americans. Uh, and now, let me get to 1863, Lincoln. We already know how he advocated and the reason why I got a voice today. Now, let's go to 1964. The reason why we got black delegates at the presidential conventions today. It was LBJ, the King, Martin. They, his advice was to have a white reverend from Mississippi and a black woman up in Atlantic City in order for us to advocate to have black delegates at conventions today. Now, you've seen the conventions with Trump and you've seen the conventions with the Democrats. Look how far we have come with the episodes of fear of the Willie Lynch syndrome. Look, I could go on and on about Willie Lynch on how he developed fear in black African Americans' minds, okay? I, I just want you to think about the journey, how far we have come. In order for me to speak in front of you right now, and how important it is for you to vote today. You know, there's a fella, a governor, Kemp, in Georgia, and his family and ancestors developed that fear to, to get that money on free labor. Free labor, and how he's advocating today on redirecting black folks in America, right now. And this is 2024. Think about what this man Kemp, his whole family from 1700s with Willie Lynch epics and where he is today to go ahead and redirect human rights. Because thank God for the Quakers, thank God for the abolitionists, and thank God for human rights. And we have a great decision to go ahead when we go to the ballot to make sure our vote counts. I don't understand the ignorance. There's people that's like in their 30s and 40s and they just pacify the situation. Lord, please have people to advocate and vote. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Take your time. Good morning, Special Agent Sunshine here, the missing child. Let's get it straight, who I really am. Now, whoever changed my name and signed documentation saying that I'm dead, welcome to my world. I'm very much alive, very much alive. Now, <laughs> let me just pray, Lord. It was kind of difficult getting here this morning, but here I am. Here I stand with all the health and the strength and the power that you give me to do it. And I just want to say thank you for my health and my strength. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for loving me unconditionally. Shout out to my real mother and father who do not, who wanted me dead for money. Imagine that. I was sold <laughs> for money. Wow. It's amazing. I hope it really helped you. Because whatever you got that belongs to me, that has my name on it, I promise you, I'm going to get it back. And I don't even have to fight for it. I have other people fighting for me. And God is on the forefront. Now, whoever headed this smear campaign that's going on about me, that's out here blocking every move I make, every step I take to move forward in my life, who's trying to keep me stuck, shout out to you. Because you're the head <sighs> bullpen. And once you go down, everybody that's connected with you is going down too. It's going to be the best strike I've ever made. In Jesus' name. Proverbs 19.9 says, a false witness will not go unpunished, and a liar will be destroyed. 
if God says he's going to destroy somebody or something, I promise you he means everything he says, especially when it comes to that. So destruction in everybody's life is different. It's never the same. Never the same. You can start with your house, your finances, your car, breakdown, whatever you choose to do, however you choose to do it. His will will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for the peace that surpasses all understanding. No matter how much you people try to disturb my peace that I stand in, you cannot. You will not block or stop the will of God for my life or my destiny. You will not distract me from what he has me doing, which is exposing any and everybody that's involved with this case. Whatever part you played, I promise you, you will be held accountable for whatever you've done. You're going to sit in it. I'm not saving nobody, especially my daughter, Sheree, I love you. But if you are my Judas, I'm not saving you. If you're going to prison, that's where you're going. In Jesus' name, thank you. Thank you. Any further speakers? Any further speakers? There being no further speakers, we will now move on to our standing committee's agenda. Our first committee is the Finance and Law Committee. Bill 973, resolution authorizing the mayor and the city solicitor to enter into a professional services agreement or agreements with Summers, McDonald, Hudock, Guthrie, and Rauch in an amount not to exceed $60,000 over one year for legal services related to pending litigation involving city employees. A motion. Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Bill 973, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Affirmative recommendation. Bill 975. Bill 975. Resolution further amending resolution number 840 of 2019, effective December 23rd, 2019, as amended, entitled. Resolution adopting and approving the 2020 capital budget and the 2020 community development block grant program and the 2020 through 2025 capital improvement program by decreasing West Ohio Street Bridge by $75,000 and increasing bridge upgrades by $75,000. Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, all those in favor of Bill 975, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Affirmative recommendation, Bill 976. Bill 976, resolution further amending resolution number 886 of 2021, effective December 27, 2021, entitled Resolution Adopting and Approving the 2022 Capital Budget and the 2022 Community Development Block Grant Program and a 2022 through 2027 capital improvement program by reducing bridge preservation and restoration fund by $26,898 and increasing bridge upgrades by $26,898. Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Bill 976, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Affirmative recommendation, Bill 977. Bill 977, resolution further amending resolution number 723 of 2022, effective December 27th, 2022, as amended, entitled, Resolution Adopting and Approving the 2023 Capital Budget, the 2023 Community Development Program, and the 2023 through 2028 Capital Improvement Program, by reducing bridge preservation and restoration fund by $120,650, reducing parking lot bridge at Woodruff Street by $2,000, and increasing bridge upgrades by $122,650. Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Bill 977, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Affirmative recommendation, Bill 978. Bill 978, resolution further amending resolution 857 of 2023, effective December 27, 2023, as amended, entitled, Resolution Adopting and Approving the 2024 Capital Budget, the Proposed 2024 Community Development Program, 
and a 2024 through 2029 capital improvement program by reducing bridge preservation and restoration fund by $127,950, reducing parking lot bridge at Woodruff Street by $5,000, and increasing bridge upgrades by $132,950. Motion to approve. Second. Dis discussion. Discussion. Councilperson Charlin. Just real quickly, and um, the chair might be able to answer this. Is this how we're planning on using this bridge preservation fund? Is that money is put in there and then we will move it into individual bridge projects that looks like what's happening here? There's someone who can speak to this who's present in chambers or online? I, I don't need an answer today, but I would if we can get communication for this by Tuesday. Absolutely. We'll get Director Lucas to answer this question for you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Bill 978, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Affirmative recommendation, Bill 979. Bill 979. Resolution providing for the sale of certain property <clears throat> acquired by the City of Pittsburgh at tax sales items A through AC. <clears throat> 3033 Center Avenue, Council District 6, 5511 Broad Street, Council District 9, 6407 Dean Street, Council District 9, 6414 Dean Street, Council District 9, 6412 Dean Street, Council District 9, 6410 Dean Street, Council District 9, 603 Lincoln Avenue, Council District 9, 916 Garrett Street, Council District 9, 914 Garrett Street, Council District 9, 913 North Myrtland Street, Council District 9, 7036 Bennett Street, Council yeah. District 9, 7034 Bennett Street, Council District 9, 818 through 820 Oakwood Street, Council District 9, 1 Oakwood Place, Council District 9, 560 Sickle Street, Council District 9. 568 Sickle Street, Council right. District 9. 4613 Chatsworth Street, Council District 5. 126 Mansion Street, Council District 5. Zero Mansion Street, Council District 5. 240 Renova Street, Council District 5. 203 Kingsborough Street, Council District 3. Zero Paul Street, Council District 2. 2662 Glasgow Street, Council District 2. 22 Conestoga Street, Council District 2. 27 Conestoga Street, Council District 2. 2023 Mountford Avenue, Council District 6. 3580 Elmhurst Avenue, Council District 1. 0 Charles Street, Council District 3. And 410 Rochelle Street, Council District 3. <clears throat> Motion to approve. Second with discussion. Discussion. I, uh, Council per, uh, Councilwoman Kale Smith, followed by Councilwoman Warwick. Thank you. Can, Aaron, could you come to the table? Thank you. Do you want to introduce yourself for the public? And Aaron Pickett, uh, manage, real, real estate manager. Thank you, Aaron. I just first want to say thank you for all the work over the years. You've been really, you know, easy, great to work with. I appreciate that you're, you usually give council some um, information on what's happening in their district. But I do think lately I have not received the information about what's happening with these properties, and I do care. So I want to know what these properties are in District 2, if, uh, you, if you have the information there. Yeah, th those are just, uh, um, just our regular sales um, that we vetted with the um, submission of ap application for the purchaser, city of Pittsburgh resident. Um, there's nothing uh, really in terms of like development or anything in terms of a developer or any action like that. But are they using the homes? Is there a home on these? On these? Yeah, these are homes. So these are they the re re renovating the homes? Yeah, they're planning, they're planning to uh, renovate the properties. Because okay, you know, we've been waiting for the one on Stratmore Street. There's several on Stratmore Street that were purchased. Okay. And I've seen no movement. They look, they look horrible. Okay. And so I'd like to see some follow up on this because they have two years to to do something with the property once yep. we sell it to them, Absolutely. or otherwise it reverts back to the city, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Or do we have to take action to do to revert? We have back? to take action. Okay, so to I'm going to do that. that. I'm going to look at some of the ones that are that people are holding in my district, and I'm going to do that because what I honestly what I would love to do. First of all, I don't even like the land bank, but I would love to, for everything to go through this department, mm -hmm. and I would like to see us 
give all these properties to, for a dollar to any landlord that's currently a good landlord in the city of Pittsburgh that's willing to make them affordable in the city of Pittsburgh and use the Housing Opportunity Fund to renovate those homes to get Absolutely. these properties you know, up and running and, and, um, and then we would have some more affordable housing. So if it were me, I would do it a little bit differently, but I just want to um, say that I appreciate working with you and um, all the work that you've done over the years. So thank Absolutely. You. Thank you, Councilperson Warwick. Yeah, so I just want to clarify. So these are, these all have specific buyers? Yes. Okay, and. Um, and I can uh, get you more detail in terms of uh, the reasoning for ap application submission and what their intentions are. And can we, I'm just looking in the files. I mean, are the buyers listed in the files? Yeah, they will be. Looks like they are, yeah. Yep. Okay. okay, so I can look at those. And then I did have one question mm -hmm. on uh, Zero Mansion Street. I looked that up uh, on Google Maps and nothing came up. I just want to make sure that was, that the house number or the, you know, street number was correct. Yeah, you know what? I'll have to revisit that and um, I'll give you some more detail on it. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, Council Person Warwick, do you wish to strike that for now with a voice amendment is if that's in your district or or get clarification before tuesday well let's get clarification and then if it's the wrong house number we can maybe amend it then before you. you know okay yeah uh okay. councilwoman gross followed by councilman mosley thank you uh, mr pickett this is a, uh, a lot of properties and so these are ones that are mostly have been people kind of came to the desk and said like i'd like to buy yes. this property right yes. and so yes. and then just for a reminder since we had this conversation a few weeks ago night maybe five or six weeks ago now about side yard sales mm -hmm. and there was some confusion that there was no path for people to buy properties but what we're looking at in this bill is the path mm -hmm. right absolutely okay so yep. can you just kind of refresh our minds about like how did these bills come to our or how do these properties come to our approval kind of what happened before they got here on this bill just as briefly yep. as you can yep so what what happens is these are properties that are adjacent to uh city of pittsburgh residents this is not the side yard sale bill this is bill 2024 0979 is that right right 0979 yeah mm -hmm. the 24 20, 09, 08. No, we're on 0979, above that one. Oh, correct. Those are, those are ones that, there, there are auction sales, and those are... Describe just briefly, Okay. as so, if no one's ever heard of this before, absolutely. for so, the public, what happened? How did these bills get to us today? So what happens is um, whomever's interested in acquiring a property from the city of Pittsburgh, um, there's a process that you have to go through. That process is the application process. The application process is where we vet the properties um, in order to sell these properties as 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 as, a, as a finance department. These properties are vetted, um, and that's where we arrive where we are because we get final approval from council in order to proceed. And in the vetting process, uh, we're looking at a lot of various things. We're looking at if it's available for sale. We're talking to council members, etc., in order to uh, arrive at this. Uh, at this gathering today. Okay, great. And then, so after we, if we approve this today and approve each of the properties that are listed here today, what happens after that? After that, um, the next step is a title report. A title report um, is given to the city of Pittsburgh. That is that is approved by our law department. Um, and then, upon that process, we uh, execute a deed uh, and a closing for the property to be uh, dispersed to whomever was whomever was interested in acquiring it from the city of Pittsburgh. Excellent, thank you. Um, and so how long is it taking you these days? So let's say we get final approval on this bill on Tuesday. Um, that process be between Tuesday and when the person like finally gets to put their name kind of on the title or on the deed. How long is that taking these days? So just to back up a bit, our, our streamlining, streamlining process upon approval is three to five weeks. Um, that's been... Uh, seemingly faster than we've ever been in the history of the city of Pittsburgh. It, pr prior to that, in my intention for over a decade, it's been over eight to 12 weeks. So we condensed that into a smaller version. Uh, from this point on, it goes, it goes to 
our law department, which it takes another three months or whatever, and that's for the title process. And that's, if you're getting a title from anybody, that's, that's the standard in terms of uh, processing. So from this point on, it's probably another six months until we have a deed in the person's hand. That's a lot better than it was about 10 years ago, wasn't it? Absolutely. It's about a quarter of the time it was, maybe <laughs> 10 years ago. So that is congratulations to the real estate and the finance department for really streamlining that process because that's been something that council has been talking about for 10 years. So I appreciate that. And I don't know what the, the connection problem is on our Zoom call, but if our IMP department can make that go away, it'd be so great. Our uh, IMP, de our, yeah, our cable bureau is working on it. Zoom, uh, our Wi-Fi was out for a minute, I'm working to get Zoom and everything back up and running. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I didn't know what it was, but it's just been there in the background. Um, and then, so this looks to be about 20 to 30 properties. I'm not really counting them up. Um, and then I've got an update from about a month ago from Director Gula that just this year, so since January 1st, 2024, um, there had been some 480 applications received for these properties. Correct. Again, not side yard. This is Correct. just, if, if you see, oh, there we went away and came back again. <laughs> Sorry, um, if the property is anywhere in the city and you're any person in the world, um, you can apply to yep. buy these properties. Absolutely. Right. Yep. And then so 480 have been, 140 were denied. So again, mm -hmm. that's your job and you guys are doing that. We have certain criteria for being allowed. For example, you can't already be in debt to the city, you know, that kind of thing. And then so 332 approved and then since there's a lag, some of these approvals might have happened last year, but there's been, I think, some $640,000 generated with property sales. Again, and that's over and above and separate from side yard sales. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to, us to revisit that for a minute because that is... Um, you know, this is yet another batch that we'll add. So it'll Absolutely. be more than 640000 and it'll be more than the... Um, 330 properties that were approved this year. Okay, yep. just for the record, I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, Councilman Mosley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for coming uh, here today, Aaron. First, I, I want to say I would um, like to sit down with you before next Tuesday and kind of just get a briefing, being that I think the almost the majority, if not the plurality of uh, the properties that we're discussing today are in, in District 9, so I would definitely like a more detailed briefing um, you know, on those properties, and you talked about um, the kind of time horizon uh, from today to, you know, uh, the completion of the process. But, um, you know, what is the time horizon that started, that, that brought us here? How long does it take, you know, for uh, the properties to get to the table today when someone puts an application? And how long is that process before so, it gets to so our ideally, table? So ideally, uh, the approval process um, will take three to, three to six weeks, and then to this point, um, probably like another month after that. Okay, so so within like the last six weeks, you received applications for all these properties that are before us today. Yep, and some of these are prior to council going on the session break. So okay, as well. Okay, and 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 as as my esteemed colleague you know mentioned that uh, that there's a I guess it was 140 that got denied over the course of the year. What are the types of things? the criteria that would cause someone to get denied so the the criteria is, is um you can't owe anything municipal to the city of pittsburgh so that's outstanding taxes uh water bills etc those are the things that we kind of deny um also we're mindful of um things of our retention of pro properties we sometimes we it's a property that we may need and we don't want to release so we have to think about that sometimes Sure. Um, are, are, are things like, you know, like, like LLCs and other things taken into consideration during that process? Well, that, that's also part of the application process. So you can submit application two ways. You can submit through an LLC or an individual. However, the background checks are a little different because we're looking uh, a little different into an LLC as opposed to a, a person. Uh, the, you know, obviously you're running different things in the business so that we're looking at, and that's your employees, et cetera. Okay. And do you know, uh, if any or how many of these potential properties would be LLCs? Um, in the in the information that we provide, it'll have the person who submitted it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd definitely like to look look that over uh, between 
um, you know, uh, now on Monday. And, and, and besides what you described, like what are other potential criteria do you uh, look at um, doing a side-by-side comparison of right. uh, individual's application versus LLC application? Right. So, for instance, uh, another example of denial, especially for SAD yard programs, it, it has to be less than 5,000 square feet. Uh, also, it can't be a three-family home. So there's other, and it can't be a business such like a, like a standing barber shop or whatever for the SAT yard program. Those are some of the other criteria that do, doesn't allow um, somebody to purchase acquire property from the city of Pittsburgh. Right, and and and, and you had mentioned you know in, intentionality. So what are the types of in, in, intention and final uses that you're specifically looking for when you're considering whether you're going to accept or deny application? So. Obviously, we, we want to make sure that uh, specifically for the SAT yard program, because that's one of our most active, is that you're absolutely using it for that purpose. We want you to have uh, some extra space, you know, for um, for growing, um, you know, plants or, or vegetables, et cetera. That's what that program is designed for. It's not okay. really designed for uh, a new construct, et cetera, like that. Okay. And, and then but specifically for Bill uh, 0979, which isn't the SAT yard program, but, right. you know, these... These, uh, so, you know, I, I assume residential properties, you know, you know, what is the, the intentions that you're looking for specifically um, when you're uh, choosing whether to accept or deny the application? So, so what we're looking for there is um, just being a community partner. Um, we like for um, our, our city of Pittsburgh residents that, as, as Councilwoman Smith said, if you're going to develop this property or you're going to take this property and rehab it for beautification and whatever purpose that is for affordable housing, we want to make sure that you're doing that. Okay. So those are our top priorities in terms of vetting. Absolutely. Okay. Now, thank you so much. I definitely want to, you know, you to sit down and, and, and have a briefing. And, you know, I'm happy to move this forward today, but I definitely want to get more details before the final vote on Tuesday. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Any further first round? Councilman Conkell. Yep. Hi, Aaron. How you doing? I want to echo Councilwoman Kale Smith's mm -hmm. uh, comments. You're always very helpful to me and very knowledgeable as to, you know, the property and many times you bring it up to me so I, I really appreciate the, your knowledge on this and bringing it to my attention I notice there's nothing in district 4 is it because we don't have the stock there that others do so with district 4 district 4 is one of the neighborhoods that has one of the highest retentions in terms of homes mm. so don't. I, <laughs> I live in that district myself but um, yeah there's more homeowners that retain their properties there, and that's why you don't see such a turnover. And then, or, and pay taxes, and then the property falling into uh, disrepair right. and things like that. Right. Do you have a uh, a listing or a spreadsheet as to how many city-owned properties with a structure on it are in District okay. Four or by district? Yeah, I can I can give it to you by district as well. However, we made such a strong effort. Now it's on the city of Pittsburgh's website. So everybody right. has access to that, and you can break it down into um, what what neighborhood, what district, etc. And you can actually print that yourself. Our city City of Pittsburgh residents, not just us as as internal people for, for government, but they have access to that as well. So they, right. that information is now available for uh, our residents as well. That's great. Um, and as far as uh, the listing price, who determines what the property's worth? So we we do that internally, um, and. So we set the price. We, we're, we set the price, yeah. It's not a bidding process. Well, it, it can go to a bidding process. That's if we have more than one multiple yeah. purchaser. Mm. Yeah, I think I was involved in one of those. Right, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. the auction you were, yeah. yeah. Right, right. That's where it goes then if there's more than one. Yeah, it'll go to auction and it comes up to, up to the courts and then whomever has the uh, highest price, high, highest asking price is the person who gets the property. Yeah, but basically you start at the up price and way of back taxes yep, and things of that nature that that upset price is typically the amount of taxes that that we acquired the property for in terms of uh, acquis, uh acquiring it to resell right but then we list them at like market value just because they may owe twenty five thousand dollars in tax back taxes uh if we feel that property is worth eighty thousand dollars we listed at eighty thousand well that's the appropriate way to do it we right. want to we want to be in the same playing field as everyone so we have to make sure, even even if there's asking of, you know, how did you arrive at this at this price? We can say we use we use comparables that are uh, value to market. And once they inquire and start the application process, um, do they have a chance to negotiate the price with us or no? No. Um, however, what we do encourage um, anyone that submits application, uh, 
if you're in disagreement, we, we allow you to provide something formal, um, letting us know that, that, that you're, you're in disagreement, and then we take that into consideration, and, and, and then there may be uh, an opportunity for us to do some adjusting. All right. So do we have like a real estate agent who determines the price? You, you actually determine the price? Well, not me per se. Now it's a collective internal group, so okay. we, we got all our bases covered. Um, that's all. Uh, thanks, Aaron. I, I appreciate all you do. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate yeah. you as well. Thank you, Councilperson Charlin. Aaron, uh, thank you for being here today. I'm always uh, happy to see some of my properties move through here. Um, and the report that's included with the legislation uh, is just really just helpful. I can see that this, both the properties, I, I think it's just two, um, are, that are moving in my district are being used for green space, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is exactly, I mean, yeah. is, is great. Um, and I can also see who's purchasing them and they're not going to LLCs, they're going to individuals. Yep. Um, again, all stuff that I wanna see. One thing that I was curious about though, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't say on the legislation that came to us if this went to auction. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that the properties that went through, I didn't look through everyone else's properties. Mm -hmm. I'm mostly concerned with mine, <laughs> but it, would that be listed on the, the sheet that came through legislation if there was an auction there? Or is that um, you just put the, um, you know, who won the auction? So you mean down the road whenever, whenever we have more than, that's why it's not on there? Right, if there, if yeah. there were more, multiple, yeah. you know, can I, so like one property went for 3,500, do I know if that's an auction price or was that the price that was listed and they were the only person that, that was interested in it? Oh, uh, right. It would, it would be an auction price. Okay. Um, we wouldn't adjust that until we got something formal and then, um, we, we would definitely have to give recognition of that. So, okay, cool. Um, glad to see that and happy to see properties continue to move through. Thank you. Um, specifically green space. Now that we have an owner, that's someone that we can hold accountable to maintaining their property and we don't have to spend city resources on cutting the grass um, <laughs> when we do cut it twice a year or whatever we're able to do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sackerbaum, Councilperson Warwick, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I just wanted, so um, I, I found the, the info with the owners and all okay. that listed. So thank you. Yeah. Um, it's in the link. Uh, yeah. Um, for the intended use, so I've got one that's an auxiliary building, two that are green space, and mm -hmm. one that's a rehab, like a rehab of the house. Are those, are the green space ones, I mean, as an intended use, is that, is there like a deed restriction or something, or is that just, for, go ahead. For sad yards, but not auctions, um, for sad yards, there's a deed restriction, absolutely. Okay, so, so this, and, and, and I can see too that the buyers all live if not next door in the yeah, vicinity so that's, that's a sad yard yep in the vicinity yep um so we have oh you mean so this so this this chunk of sales some are side yards some are yeah not. some are auctions and I, some are sad yards okay yeah. oh i'm sorry yeah 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 sorry sorry i was waiting yep okay so so for the regular so auctions if there's an intended use is that something that we so for for the regular there could be um vacant land and when, when and if that vacant land is sold in the auction process we're charging market value for that right so and then they're there they they, they there may isn't say a deed that restriction it's, in that they, they're able you know to okay so they may say that it's their intended use i yeah. mean it, it's fine i'm not yeah that's just quite, for the application just, process uh, we get that a lot people will say oh I'm, i want to do green space however they might have a different intention and then they do something else. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's right. That is what it is. Um, and again, I guess just to, to declare our Councilman Charlin's question. So we, because one of them went for 10,000. Mm -hmm. That's the one with the house on it. Mm -hmm. Would that have been an auction? Yep, that's an auction sale. So you know, so how do you know if it it's was not, an auction? It's not, that's just the, just uh, it's a higher sorry, price. that's just the uh, term for this type of sale. It's not oh, an oh, auction oh. per se. The auction per oh. se happens, sorry, yeah. that's probably the context is probably a little confusing. That's just the, the term that we, that's used for the type of sale. Okay. And then there's an actual auction that happens um, along the way when we have multiple purchasers after, after council approval, et cetera. And this is during the um, 
finalization process. Oh, okay. We're at the end of the line. There's and an so, auction that happens. I mean, again, it doesn't. I guess it it doesn't really matter. It's more just out of curiosity to know mm -hmm. it, to know if there if there was a bidding war, like if there mm -hmm. were two folks there, there interested. Could be, there in. could be on these properties. Mm -hmm. However, the actual auction for them to bid will take place further down the line. What's that placement? further down the line so if someone what contests the sale exactly Multiple. oh so we approve the sale and then and then a and then neighbor can contest along. it yep. after this point yep. oh God, that seems anyway okay that seems like a lot of work and then to have someone contest it oh it is you'd think you'd want someone to contest it ahead of time right oh mm -hmm. Seems easier to have someone contest it up front and then deal with yes. it then. But okay, all right, um, all right. Thanks. I guess that's uh, that, and then just to again just to verify that address. Okay. Zero Mansion Street. I yeah. just didn't find it. So. So uh, more than likely that's a piece of vacant land, and I'll, I'll provide you the block and lot for it. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Any further discussion? Second round. Councilman uh, Coghill. Thank you. Um, so Aaron, I didn't know there's a two year limit. Once you put your application in, and if you don't move on that property or do anything with it, we have the ability to take it back. Uh, not necessarily, we have to do a little No, we have to go to court. We have to go to court. Yeah, we have to look into So if they buy it and just leave it there, we can at least cite them, fine them for whether it's cutting the weeds or what, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have a, in your department you actually have um, a crew that will go out and maintain these properties right yeah because we're always calling I'm always calling you know public works and whatnot but you actually have access to you don't use public works you actually have your own people we have a land we have a land maintenance crew yeah um, who we um, subcontract um, uh, contractors oh. to do okay. To do the work. So we use subcontractors. Yep. You don't use City of Pittsburgh employees no, for that. No. I see. These are these are uh, community partners that we use. Right. So you have funds set aside for that reason because you've taken care of a couple properties I know on my end. So. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's it, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any further discussion? Second round. Seeing none. All those in favor of Bill 979, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Affirmative recommendation. Bill 980. Bill 980, resolution providing for the conveyance by the city of Pittsburgh of certain property having been placed for sale to adjoining property owners in conjunction with the city of Pittsburgh side yard program items A through I. Zero Webster <laughs> Avenue, Council District 6. Zero Webster <laughs> Avenue, Council District 6. 408 North Matilda Street, Council District 9. 6739 Atwell Street, Council District 9, 5 Tecumseh Street, Council District 5, 400 Marlowe Street, Council District 2, 29 Conestoga Street, Council District 2, 1022 High Street, Council District 1, and 0 Holbrook Street, Council District 1. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Bill 980, please indicate by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Affirmative recommendation. Bill 981. Bill 981, resolution repealing an item in resolution number 620 of 2016, effective date de October 21st, 2016, in order to rescind the sale. Wait, where's that? Oh. Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Briefly, just what we're rescinding a sale from uh, the 2016 sale, is that what's going on? Correct. Okay. Sunnyland Avenue. I got, I got so my- So actions we take after two years, right? <laughs> I got my information from- <laughs> In the gallery. From, from a, a nod over there, so I'm good, thank you. <laughs> Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor yeah. of Bill 981, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Affirmative recommendation. We will now move, actually skip ahead a bit to um, Public Safety and Wellness Committee chaired by Councilman Coghill.
And I'll give the clerk a minute to <laughs> get there since I did not warn her. Bill 969. Okay. Bill 969. Bill 969, resolution authorizing the mayor and the director of public safety to enter on behalf of the city of Pittsburgh into a professional services agreement or agreements with Astrophysics Inc. for x-ray machine maintenance and warranty services at a total cost not to exceed $32,075 over five years. Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? This is uh, public safety. We skipped to it. My only question would be why there's a uh, waiver of competitive process for this particular bill. But I want to see that. Yeah, yeah, we're trying to get him out of here. But that's something I'm comfortable um, receiving before Tuesday. We can discuss. But could we get somebody to answer that at the table? Because this is something. He's yeah, that's something. He's director. Yeah. Oh, I can see. Morning. My name is Takina White. I'm Assistant Director of Public Safety. Um, so to answer the question, the machine was purchased from Astrophysics, and they have the warranty, um, and they are the only ones that can service the machine. Mm -hmm. so, there's a warranty. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, they are the only ones that can service the machine. And they offer the warranty. Charles Showers, Manager of Personnel and Finance for Public Safety. Yes, this is um, uh, the. The manufacturer of the machine, it's the one in the basement of the building. They're the only, they, the manufacturer of the machine that's, we've had it for several years now. The warranties run out. This is to renew the warranty, basically. Okay. Thank you. That answers my question. Any other discussion on Bill 969? Seeing none, all those in favor of Bill 969, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Affirmative recommendation. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Bill 970. Bill 970, resolution authorizing the mayor and the director of public safety wow. to enter on behalf of the city of Pittsburgh into a professional services agreement or agreements with 100 Public Safety Inc. doing business as performance protocol to identify and implement solutions to further improve Pittsburgh Bureau of Police recruitment and retention efforts at a total cost not to exceed $38,172 over one year. A motion to approve brief discussion. 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 Uh, yep. So I talked to Director Schmidt about this yesterday, and this is really just a. Um, you want to come to the tent? Yeah. Because I mean it with authority. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? You know, introduce yourself. Anthony Palermo, Commander, Chief of Staff. That's a great Italian name, Anthony. I love it. Um, <laughs> So Anthony, um, I, it was explained this yesterday to me as to uh, what this is about. This is for recruiting, making sure we do the proper procedures and best practices for recruiting, I believe. And we're hiring this, I don't know if I call it a firm or company, but um, to help us do so, correct? Correct. Okay. And how much is it? 38,000? Yes, uh, 38,000 yeah, is the change. Okay, that's for one year only a year it's not an annual thing maybe Correct. we will maybe we won't i guess it's um depends a lot on of it is training yeah, for right. our personnel so it's stuff that we will learn and then can carry forward as the years go on mm -hmm. okay ah, that's it for me thank you councilwoman kale smith so i i have a lot to say about this actually but i understand that this is not a large amount of money but we have to have a bigger and broader conversation about re police and police retention and the effectiveness and what we're doing with policing in the city of Pittsburgh. I actually think it's time for council to look at the bureau itself and restructure some of it ourselves legislatively. Because what I'm seeing happen, happening here is a lot of people are getting promoted and off the streets. There's not a lot of people on the streets. We're not doing a lot to maintain and to retain the officers that we have. A lot of officers feel devalued. A lot of are leaving the Bureau. Um, a lot, we lost a lot this past summer. We're expecting to lose even, uh, again, another round of, of officers. And for me, spending money to retain people when maybe sometimes it's empowering them, treating them differently, 
um, hearing some of their concerns. When you have a, leadership, a lot of leadership that seems to want to dis disseminate, d d dismantle the entire bureau, I don't see any value in trying to attract people when we're actually trying to destroy it. It looks to me like you're trying to merge this Pittsburgh police with Allegheny County police. That's what this really looks like. Because when I'm seeing the numbers, when I'm seeing what's happening in our bureaus, when I'm seeing that I, I don't think some bureaus don't, or some bu zones don't have enough officers in them, and that, I mean, actually, probably most of them probably don't have a lot of officers in it. I'm not liking what I'm seeing with the Pittsburgh Bureau of Police right now. It will be definitely part of our conversations coming forward in the budget. And, um, and the numbers of officers that, that we're planning on the budget. I voted no last year because the numbers were so low. They're low again this year. So I'm saying it's time for council to, to look at this, not as if you know, we want to work with everybody. Not, we have a responsibility to the residents of the city of Pittsburgh to keep them safe. And so for me, if that means I vote no for every budget, if that means we restructure the department, if that means there's no, one chief and every other person is on the streets, then that's what we have to do. But we're going to do what we have to do to make this city safe and to do what our residents expect us to uh, expect of us. That's it for me for today. Thank you. And I realize this is all part of, you know, you, you're, you're part of a, a, bigger, a bigger, you know, effort here. So I'm not saying this directly in some way to you or to you. I'm saying in general, we need to step up to the plate. Council needs to step up to the plate and stop the this yeah, dismantling of the Pittsburgh Bureau of Police. Thank you. Thank you. Councilperson Charlin, followed by Councilperson Warwick. Yes, uh, thank you for being here. So help me understand ex what this expenditure does to help us retain a uh, recruit police. Sure. Um, so prior to last year, we've not had a truly organized recruitment team within the Bureau of Police. Internal, yeah. Internally, yeah. yes. Uh, so we stood that up over the past several months um, using monies from a grant that we received from the state to improve retention. Uh, we sought to seek expertise out from a company uh, that specializes in training police departments how to better recruit, more efficiently recruit the right candidates and then furthermore retain them to improve their um, environment, improve their working conditions, to keep them. So not only it, get them. Improve them as candidates or improve them both. after they, okay. Both. After, okay. So guys, not just get people to apply course, yeah. and take the test, yeah. but keep them engaged throughout the process so we retain as many high quality candidates as possible during the hiring process. And then once we onboard them uh, to keep them long term within the Bureau. Gotcha. And so this is for that training for our internal team that that's what this 38,000 does is pays our internal team to get that training or correct. Okay. And, um, did we go out to bid for this, this group? Okay. Yes. This was RFP and I believe they were the only respondents. We had three respondents. Three, oh, three respondents. Okay. I, did they have a good track record? I mean, this is something that I know we follow our procurement practice, but this is something that for me, it would be worth paying a premium to have that kind of training so that, you know, we can, this is one of the most important things that we do in the city here, frankly. Yes, this company has uh, been on contract with over 30 departments across the country. Uh, they have produced case studies with numerous departments to include Boise, Maui, um, and a few others to show the effect they've had in improving those departments' recruitment efforts. Okay. They specialize solely on public safety recruitment. Great. Um, so I, I, I do want to ask, you know, how is... Uh, how is recruitment and, and retaining going? I mean, I know that we've, we've launched this team. Have we been able to implement our, our strategies here? Yeah, so to date, the efforts that we've been able to stand up is I have, I'll call it one and a half full-time recruitment officers. Um, one officer is solely devoted to recruitment. The other splits time between uh, wellness initiatives and recruitment. We have around 15 adjunct or part-time recruiters that signed on throughout the Bureau, different ranks, different units. Um, initial, I guess, efforts taken so far uh, is working closely with 
human resources and civil service. We have anybody applying to take the exam or has passed the exam has received constant communication from our recruiter uh, in terms of next steps, things to do to prepare to take the test, how to prepare for the physical fitness test, the reading test. We have run, uh, I believe to date, two practice physical fitness tests to help okay. better prepare the candidates. Um, we've stepped up our visibility at different job fairs and career fairs at universities and other organizations. Uh, so those are just some of the few things we've done in the past few months. Great. All right. Um, well, we'll continue to, uh, the, there's not a community meeting that at least I can say I go to where we don't talk about police recruitment and what we're going to do to get our numbers up um, and, and keep them up. Um, you know, and then the other end of the, the spectrum is what we can do to stop officers from leaving. Um, I was in a meeting last Friday with someone, um, you know, relatively new in, in the mayor's office. And she said to me, you know, we really need to stop officers from leaving, leaving the force and going to other municipalities. Like we pay for their training and, and we need to stop them from leaving. And it was like, Yep, we've all had that realization that this is this is a major thing that we would love to stop. There's a lot of barriers for for what stops us from doing that. Um, love to learn from other municipalities about what we can do to make sure that those officers aren't aren't leaving, um, because you know, as I think quickly as you start working in this building, the light bulb goes off that like, hey, this is a is a major problem for us that uh, Bethel Park or um, Northern Regional or whoever else is able to recruit the benefits of our um, our training here. So um, I'm hopeful that with this expenditure that we can uh, put some things in place that can move us forward. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Councilperson Warwick. Um, yeah, thanks. So I, I guess just to sort of just some comments overall about my, my impression kind of of the of the goals of 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 our kind of reimagining policing in Pittsburgh and, and where it feels like we are, you know, where, <laughs> where we were, where it feels like we are and maybe where we still need to get to. So, I mean, my understanding just from being in, in the communities that I represent is that we are looking to get back toward kind of the, the, kind of the old school sort of officer friendly, like there's an officer in the community that knows the community, right? This idea of community policing where, where it's not just at your worst moment that you meet this police officer, right? That, that they're, they're around. So, um, but before, um, and, and maybe still now to, you know, there, our, our force was very siloed into specialties, right? Like there's folks who do, this job and there's folks who do this job and there's folks who do this job and 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 they don't they don't do the other things right so there isn't room and then the other issue uh was that um our officers were literally responding to every single call right every single call whether urgent or otherwise so you know over the past year my again this is my understanding is that we have um you know, for non-urgent calls, we've uh, sort of made this telephone reporting unit mandatory so that, you know, if I call because somebody broke into my car in the middle of the night and I came out in the morning and the window's broken, you know, there's no point in having an officer come and write down that report. You can just call that in. So that is freeing up time. Um, uh, it, it, seems like we're not quite there yet on like activating our specialized officers to also be doing that community policing and you know maybe there's a little bit of change management still you know getting through that um but um you know at the end of the day you know we've got 90 neighborhoods and it seems like even with the force that we have we should you know so let's just say there's three shifts right in a day We've got 90 neighborhoods. I don't see why we can't have an officer who is dedicated at each shift to each neighborhood. I mean, that'd be like just under 300 officers, right? So I, again, maybe this is not, you know, kind of simplistic, but that's kind of what, what it seems like we should be able to get there. And, um, and in terms of, of um, retention, 
and, uh, and recruitment, obviously an increase in pay, which there was a significant increase in pay, we're still not there. We're still not competitive with the, the other boroughs, is my understanding, unfortunately. But, you know, incrementally we'll get there, hopefully. Um, but, you know, what I would like to see, and, and you know, and I've, I, I've expressed this to my commanders and to the chief as well, is again, like patrols in the neighborhoods, and not constantly every day, but you know, somebody going through to getting to know the business districts, getting, you know, ha someone who can stop by the after school program and say hi from time to time, um, just to make those community connections. And then when, and then, and then as part of that, of sort of being in the neighborhood, when you are not actively on a call, it would be great to have uh, officers doing, um, you know, simple traffic enforcement stuff. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, if, if you're in patrol around the neighborhood, you know, someone's running the red light, just kind of have a little, a little circuit of uh, traffic enforcement to kind of get the cars to slow down. That to me feels like the, the ideal. Uh, and I think we're trying to get there. I don't think we're there yet, but, um, at any rate, I don't know if you have any, feel free if you have any comments to that. No, I would say absolutely that's the goal that we're, we're working towards, uh, improving horizontal communication across all facets of the Bureau and getting back to that where the visibility is high and the engagement is high. Uh, I think we're making improvements, but we're not there yet and we'll keep working until we get there. Yeah, and, and I mean, a lot of that is, you know, when, it, when you talk about change management, that's sort of like a corporate speak, something. you know, but it is yeah, getting people on board with that. It's making sure that the, that the workforce understands the goals, understands why, and, is, and feels like they are appreciated as, you know, appreciated and included as part of that plan. I don't know, and, and hopefully some of this, this training can... Chief. Maybe some of this training can help help with that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should be the <laughs> Anyway, thank you. I appreciate Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Mosley. Yeah, thank you for being here, here today. Um, you know, my first question is about, you know, understanding that, um, you know, the challenges that, that we face, um, you know, with public safety and recruitment and retention of officers is obviously, you know, not um, a, a challenge you know, that we face solely, you know, here in Pittsburgh as part of a national trend that we see, um, you know, around the country. You mentioned Boise um, and, and, and Maui, um, you know, as examples that the consultant um, that, that you're proposing to work with, um, you know, has cited, um, you know, as, as, as examples of, of being able to um, recruit and retain you know, at a higher level than other places. Are there other, you know, cities, um, around the country that we can look to for best practices that um, are, um, you know, uh, addressing this problem um, in, in a productive way, you know, working through this challenge? Sure, I think you're, we're always looking to learn from other successes. Um, one of those, um, for, just for example, Washington DC Metro, they've recently undergone um, over the past, I'll say five to seven years, improvements in how they market their department. So largely going away from print media or radio and going to more targeted marketing through social media and different search apps. So that's the other avenue that we're looking and trying to familiarize ourselves with so we can uh, be in that same market. So just from a visibility to the messaging to follow through is also important that we're staying engaged with any potential applicant so they feel valued, their questions are answered, and uh, you know, just keeping them engaged through the process because it can be lengthy hiring process just due to everything that goes into hiring a police officer. So we're constantly looking to others what went well, what didn't work, and you know, taking ideas and discarding bad ones. Thank you for that. Um, and, and can you talk just a little bit you know, about, you know, besides like using social media and moving from you know, print advertisement um, to social media engagement, you know, how was recruitment different you know, in 2024 than it was maybe in 2004? Like what are, you know, um, you know, besides you know, the reality of social media you know, that we all know has transformed our lives over the last two decades, you know, what, you know, how is it so much different to recruit a police officer in 2024 versus 2004? Uh, sure, I would say 
one of the major things is it's um, a buyer's market, essentially. Uh, when, when I came on, it was you know, X, only a limited amount of spots, openings, and a huge candidate pool. Uh, now it is a little bit flipped on its head there. So every department is looking for people and it's a smaller applicant pool. So it's about selling, your, selling, each department is trying to sell themselves of why you should come work for us. Uh, at the same time, making sure we're getting quality candidates and not just, you know, I guess reducing the standards or the requirements for admission. So it's, it's really about selling ourselves and that's where we're trying to improve. In the past, we didn't necessarily have to, we were Pittsburgh. People wanted to come work for Pittsburgh. So we still have the name recognition. Now it's just about following that up a little bit more and really uh, making sure we're on top of it and proactively going out there and selling ourselves. Where in the past, people would just come to us. Um, my next question is, you know, in, in the past, was there the same interest um, in, in, in the suburban forces or have you seen a shift and folks becoming more interested in the suburban forces and less interested, you know, in Pittsburgh, or was there always interest in the city of Pittsburgh forces and suburban forces, or, you know, are you seeing, um, you know, a shift in that over the last five to 10 years? So I don't have exact data to sure, back sure. this up. So this either. is just purely my yeah. observation. Yeah, any anecdote. Um, there has always been those that left for suburban forces. Uh, from the time I was new on the job to mid-career, you always have a percentage of individuals that find either the work pace of a suburban department more conducive, or in some cases, you know, you can speak to pay, but you, we've always had those individuals that have left to go to, you know, name a suburban police department that we lose people to. I have not seen necessarily an increase in that. I think it's just been um, maybe brought more to the forefront due to other issues. Mm -hmm. But I have not seen an increase of officers looking to, to go because a lot of these suburban departments still have the same hiring issues that we have. It's just on a much smaller scale. And, and would you, you know, you attribute, you know, all of the challenges, particularly on, on, the, on the recruitment side, I think recruitment and retention, you know, or, or, or two different things. It, can it all be attributed, you know, to the, uh, the, the, the kind of the uh, tumultuous and, and, uh, uh, year of 2020 and, and the turmoil that we went through nationally, you know, around the issue of, you know, of policing in, in the wake of the George Floyd incident? Or was, it, was this a trend mm -hmm. that you saw prior, um, you know, to everything that we went through nationally in 2020? Um, I mean, I don't think you can discount the effect that 2020 had on the profession of policing, because that was Absolutely. nationwide. Um, we also had a lull in hiring for a little bit. We're seeing our applicant numbers rise now. Not to the level we want, but we're seeing a return of that. Um, I think if there's not one single issue of why, it could be there's generational differences, there's uh, the work from home phenomenon that is appealing to individuals. So. I think it's, it's probably more complex than just, hey, 2020 happened and now we're looking for people. I think it, it was just a, a combination of different factors. Sure, and my, my final question is, um, you know, obviously, you know, we're, you know, we're putting a lot of the onus on uh, the Pittsburgh Police Force, but is there something we can do, you know, as a community, as a society, as, as <laughs> civic leaders to assist you in this effort to recruit, you know, and, and retain officers being that? You know, this is a team effort. You know, this isn't just us pointing the finger at you and you go, you know, make the streets safer. But what can we do as leaders to assist you in this effort? You know, because obviously, you know, we speak very passionately and our constituents speak very passionately about wanting to get back to the levels that we were at in the past and a level where, you know, uh, the majority, if not hopefully all of Pittsburghers, you know, you know, feel safe. But what can we do in the effort besides, you know, give you marching orders? I think just the support, word of mouth, just about the opportunities that the profession has to offer, the benefits that the career has to offer, uh, because it is, it is a great career. It's a very rewarding career. You get to, to help people. You get to do things that most people only watch on TV. And um, so I think just you know, the support and kind of the 
um, you call it the grassroots of like, hey, we're hiring. You can do these things. You can be part of the solution in, you know, around the city of helping make it a safer place, a more welcoming place, all those, all those things that we all want. Yeah, thank, thank you for your time. I'm back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Before we move to second round, I'll, I'll ask my questions. Um, thank you for being here today and for this initiative. I am glad that we covered kind of in this in this last um, set of questions the discussion around um, quality because quality candidates because I wanted to dig into that a little bit. It wasn't too long ago that this body grappled with you know the idea of reimagining public safety and, and policing and really you know and sat through many hours of hearings and conversations around how we recruit quality candidates and in particular as Chief Scarado often discusses guardians versus warrior mentality candidates. So what do you think this project will do, this agreement will do to help us um, in that effort specifically? I think it will professionalize how we, one of the selling points of these, um, I'll call it for in specific this performance protocol, what they're proposing they can do is they will look, come in and they will look at how, what we're doing right now. They'll look at what civil service and human resources is doing, what the bureau is doing. They will look at, you know, talk to the chief on his goals. What is the goal? What are we looking to attract? And then they will help us tailor that approach. So we're not necessarily, maybe instead of sending the recruiters to event A, we're not seeing much of a return on investment there. So we pivot to um, a more specific targeted approach on that. I mean, there's a lot that I, I don't know, and that's why we're looking to bring in experts in the field to teach us, hey, you're doing well here, or you can really improve in this area. Mm -hmm. So it's really just trying to um, be efficient in how we deploy our recruitment efforts and resources so we can get the candidate we want that is going to be here for the next 20 years and provide great service to the citizens. Sure. And apologies if we've kind of already answered this because I we've 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 covered it a little bit, but I want to ask in a slightly different way: Will this get to any kind of um, uh, existing structural issues with the bureau? Meaning, if we want a certain type of candidate, and that type of candidate would be attracted to a certain type of position within the bureau, say a community policing uh, position versus, you know, detective versus you know, forensic, whatever, um, uh, would, will this get into that, that, that kind of recommendations to not just the, the methods we use and the tactics we use and the strategies we use around recruitment, but the actual structure of the Bureau itself? Do you, have you seen that from other cities? I have not, but I imagine it's possible. Um, you know, our selling point here is opportunity. So uh, there's lots of opportunity mm -hmm. and the best, you know, maximizing that and emphasizing that I think is always our best recruitment tool. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move to second round. Uh, Councilwoman Kale Smith first. Thank you. I just, I want to make sure that I say this because you know, I'm, I'm, there's going to be a lot of conversation during the budget and I'm actually get, looking into some legislation myself to do some restructuring. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about that at another date. But I do want to say that I do think that the Pittsburgh Bureau of Police did an amazing job in police community relations, especially when Chief Schubert was here. He did an amazing job. He did a lot with people that I have never seen before. I mean, working with those groups that, I mean, I never saw a chief reach out the way that he, he you know, changed in, in you know, the Bureau and reached out a lot. Could it always be better? We're always striving to do better, all of us, in, in everything that we do. But I don't want to dismiss what they've done, especially when we had officers that were the, I can't remember if they were called the community engagement officers. And I was looking through some old photos and seeing the things that they did in the community and it seemed like it was so minor, you know, some of the events and things that they had, but it meant so much to our community. And, and in our side of town, um, there's such a strong relationship with our police officers and in every one of our neighborhoods. And in Chartier City is one of my only predominantly black neighborhoods. The respect that they have for the officers and the officers have for the residents is tremendous. And I would love to see that like duplicated across the city of Pittsburgh. I don't know what's so different um, on, on that side of town. And because I was born and raised in the East End, so for, to me, I don't understand what's different. 
but I will say it's a different relationship. And I definitely see the differences. But I, I would be, it would not be, I would be remiss in not in acknowledging the great work of Chief Schubert and all the officers under him at the time who worked so, so well in our communities. So I just want to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Coghill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I just want to address a couple of things that uh, some members have asked and make sure you are in agreement. I spoke at length with Director Schmidt yesterday about the, well, we first went from 900 to 850 budgeting for police officers, which I agree with 100% because we were never going to get to 900, not this year, not last year, not in two years, we're not going to get to 900. So no sense that money sitting there that could be used in other places. I don't necessarily agree from going from 850 to 800. Um, that puts us right, once we graduate our recruiting classes and get them on the street, that puts us kind of right at the number. So there's no real cushion there for hiring, whether it's from other departments or additional recruitment classes. But that's in taking into account that we're not going to lose anybody. And we know we're going to lose police officers through whether it's retirement, whether it's other departments, you name it. So I just want to be clear, um, because the impression, I will say, out there is that we're defunding the police when we go from 850 to 800. I'm confident after talking to Director Schmidt that that is not the case. Um, the reality is that we're not going to get to 800 this year with officers that we're going to lose. So next year, 800 hopefully will be the right number with a couple more recruitment classes. But I just want to make that, that clear um, to the public, I guess, really, necessarily. Um, it's important to note this is grant money for this, you know. Um, I, I guess maybe we shouldn't be, but I'm less concerned about grant money because it's not coming out of our taxpayer dollars. Maybe it is in a federal sense, but not in a local sense. So, um, and $38,000 is, you know, not so bad. I know you said you have one recruitment, full-time recruitment officer. Who, who is that? Uh, that's Officer John Bradford. Okay, yeah. So I was, uh, I got a call from, at my house about my neighbor. My neighbor lives in Dormont, and you know, I, of course, live in the city, which I found a good recruitment tactic. He said, you know, he didn't, he didn't call me because I'm a councilman. He had no idea. It wasn't Bradford. I forget who the, who the officer was. But he said, uh, you know, what, he had applied. He's been not quite accepted, but they were considering accepting him. And, you know, he was really just calling me to say, is he like howling at the moon in the middle of the night or anything, you know, any peculiar uh, traits in this individual? He seems like a great guy to me, and I, I gave him a ringing endorsement. But I think it's, you gotta be careful there because neighbors don't always get along. I get along with this fellow, and, you know, uh, I think he'd make a great police officer. I don't know his past or you know, if he has a record or anything like that. But, but anyway, just calling neighbors, I think, is a good practice, but also could be tricky because not all neighbors get along and some will intentionally you know, try to foul it up, I think. But um, to the question was brought up, I think, by Councilman Charlin to um, when we hire a police officer, there is no question that we should have a five-year commitment from any police officer signing along with the Pittsburgh police before they can go, you know, entertaining other boroughs or municipalities. Uh, we spend a great deal of time and effort in training them. Um, Councilwoman Gross and I were out at the training facility not too long ago, and it's, it's hard work. And to put them through all that and all that training and to lose them in the first month of their employment is just unacceptable to me. Uh, I don't know all the hurdles there. I've talked to Director Schmidt about it numerous times, and um, before the Director Schmidt, it was Director... Um, Teresa, who was the director before Schmidt? It was uh, public safety. Wendell Hisrich, Wendell Hisrich, which he also agreed, you know, we need to retain them by getting a commitment from them or make the municipalities pay, you know? And I know this isn't in your purview. I do. Okay, Anthony, I'm just really bringing it up. You need to put the legislation forward. Right, 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 right. Yeah, well, right. I think, do it. I think this council needs to look at that. I don't know what those hurdles are, but I'd like to find out exactly what they are and what stipulations that we have to go by. But 
for sure if they sign on for five years and any municipality that wants to hire one of our police officers should pay us back for full training we get reimbursed half from the state which yeah okay but but it's that we don't get reimbursed for the for the man hours in there and training this person so that's um that's uh it's a hard pill to swallow you said it best the best thing we have to offer in the city of pittsburgh is opportunity you know when you're getting hired by bethel park or mount lebanon or robinson township you're basically a patrol officer we're in the city of pittsburgh you can become a commander you can become a sergeant a lieutenant and you know a lot of different opportunities and it certainly is good training for if you decide to leave this department someday um you know i know many of the other police chiefs in the surrounding areas and they cherry pick us i mean it, because like you said the, the recruitment for them is down too the recruitment is down across the nation it's just not a desirable job for young men and women today to be a police officer i guess whether it goes back to 2020 as councilman um uh, as, as kari said councilman mosley <laughs> <laughs> but uh so so, so there are a lot of issues here, I would say, um, to, in trying to retain and keep our police officers. Um, but I just really wanted to be clear on a few things. Um, 900 to 850, I agreed with 850 to 800. That's okay. Any less is not good. I'd like to see this department get back up to 900, I think, is the right number. We're probably four or five years away from that, I think, to make sure we retain the ones we have and get new ones through the recruitment class. So... Um, yeah. I do want to say, Councilwoman um, Warwick said, you know, where there's no uh, need for an officer to come out if your car is broken into, if you wake up in the morning and your car is ransacked. Uh, I don't agree with that. I think people still want, when, they, when their personal property, especially something as valuable as an automobile, is broken into and ransacked, they want to see a police officer. I know we're shortage. I know we can't. We want to go to just a reporting system. But what we're finding out is the insurance companies require a police report. So, you know, I don't know how we get around that, but I know at least a half a dozen calls I've taken where cars have been broken into. First of all, they want to see a police officer. They feel violated, right? And secondly, the insurance companies are requiring a, a, a report in order to reimburse them. If it was as easy as just taking a picture and sending it to the insurance company, it might be okay. But um, so, again, that's because of the level of staffing we have, I think, where we're trying to get away from that, but I don't necessarily agree with that as well. Um, so, okay, um, I believe the Pittsburgh police are the best trained, best police force in the country. They really are. And that's what makes us so desirable. They still to, are. I should make sure I make that clear too. They yeah. still are. <laughs> and that's what makes us so desirable to, you know, I mean, they know they're getting a trained police officer with the experience of working throughout the inner city of Pittsburgh and a certain amount of credibility comes with that. And they know they don't have to put that person through the training academy and go through all that process. So, so just a couple of things. We're, we should, council should, and I will start looking at what the hurdles are for keeping a, for having them sign a commitment once we hire them for say five years, and secondly, any municipality, you know, hiring away from us, we need to control that where they need to pay us. They pay us, we get partly refunded from the state for their training, but we don't get we don't get refunded for the training that goes into that. And as I saw out at the training facility, there's a lot of training that goes into that. So a lot of hours for our instructors to put these folks through. And then just to lose them to another municipality is just heartbreaking. So, okay, um, that's it, Anthony. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Commander. Thank you. Any further second round? Seeing none, all those in favor of Bill 970, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Affirmative recommendation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Thanks, Thank you. That brings us back to invoices. Do I have a motion on invoices? <clears throat> motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of invoices, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Invoices are approved. That moves us to interdepartmental transfers. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Discussion? Councilman Charlin, Councilperson Charlin. Yeah, this interdepartmental transfer for 
two hundred thousand dollars for computer maintenance. I, uh, Councilperson Kale Smith and I were looking at this. What what is this? This is a good bit of money here in an interdepartmental transfer. So it's a, the note here says it's to cover the cost of the Esri contract and other bud, unbudgeted expenses. Um, is there someone here who can speak to this, who's present today? Brian Walston, just give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I can make a suggestion, I think this is, this warrants a discussion. So why don't we, um, come back to if we can if we can come back to this mm -hmm. later in the in the session okay we can call someone to be present is, here either is on the Zoom. clerk gonna call director norman yes okay thank you yes yeah, so the clerk is calling so if we can come back to this later in the in today's okay. briefing yeah our meeting we can uh, get that answered thank you thank you so let's move to uh We currently have interdepartmental transfers under consideration. Um, let's see, let's move to P cards. We have a motion on P cards. Motion to approve. Second. Discussion. I do have two notes on P cards. Um, there are two PayPal charges for, for this week. One was the mayor's office for catering. There is an invoice attached um, to the email that we received as council members. The second was for Bureau of Police for the PA Police Accreditation Coalition for a three-year accreditation. Any further discussion on P cards? Seeing none, all those in favor of P cards, please indicate by saying aye. 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 P cards are approved. That moves us on to Public Works and Infrastructure Committee chaired by Councilperson Warwick. Bill 982, resolution authorizing the mayor and the director of the Office of Management and Budget and the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure to enter into an agreement or agreements with the U.S. Department of Transportation for the purpose of receiving grant funds from the Safe Streets for All grant program in the amount not to exceed $1,320,000 to conduct a road safety audit of up to 10 high injury corridors, develop a vision zero focus complete streets design manual and deploy three demonstration projects. The grant requires a match from the city of Pittsburgh in the amount not to exceed $130 and a match from Carnegie Mellon University in an amount not to exceed $200,000 for this stated purpose for a total project cost of $1,650,000. Mm -hmm. Motion to approve. <clears throat> Second. Discussion. Discussion. Councilwoman Gross. Thank you. I think we have people from Domi here. Can you come up? Hello. Kim Lucas, Director for the City's Department of Mobility and Infrastructure. Thank you, Director Lucas. I appreciate you joining us today. Um, Earlier this year, we had a post agenda on complete streets and a presentation with the kind of crash, high, high injury crash network, and also priority zones. And we talked about how data is being uh, indexed into a ranking, basically, that is guiding kind of your um, traffic calming and other infrastructure work. And I um, suggested in that post agenda that there was, I think, um, in looking at the data, kind of quantitative data that is put together into create a quantitative ranking, a numerical ranking, that all kids are not vehicle users, all children under the age, like driving age, right? And I didn't see them all in the ranking. And I wonder if how that post agenda and how this grant kind of fit together 
And is there an opportunity for us to try to highlight, um, especially in the light of some of the fatalities that have happened this year after the post agenda? Like, where's your thinking on that? Thank you. Um, so two notes that I think I heard there. One was about how we prioritize for traffic calming projects. And so for anybody who's not um, familiar with that program, that was launched in 2019, I believe, in the city. It has quickly, in the last five years, become probably the most requested service of city government, um, certainly the most requested for our department. We have about a 1,000 or so outstanding requests, and we're able to do about 10 projects per year. And so the number of projects that we can do and the number of requests we receive are mismatched. Um, the way we prioritize projects for prioritization, prioritize prioritization, um, we look at data like crash data, um, number of vehicles on a street, you know, we make sure that those projects and locations are, um, that they meet our criteria for inclusion. And then we use other variables like pedestrian trip generators. So that's where children get factored in, the presence of children rather. Is there a school there? Is there a rec center? Is there a playground? That adds points to the um, selection for traffic calming. Now for this project, our high injury network um, which is about 10% of our streets are responsible for, I think, about 90% of our serious and fatal crashes. And about half of those streets are state-owned roads, um, which means we have to work with the state on those. We are going to, through a data-driven process, with whatever consultant we ultimately are able to procure, we'll select the 10 corridors. So those aren't chosen yet. So if the question is, do we have the 10 corridors that this grant will focus on selected yet? The answer is no, we don't because we know that we need to look at the data in terms of crash severity in addition to population variables like what you're describing. I'm not entirely happy with that answer. I see your logic, but I think what I uh, would suggest, um, and um, if other Which members remember the complete streets post agenda that we had, um, you know, the, the, the fatalities that we've had of children, those children weren't at their school, they weren't at the rec center, they were at their home. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I would suggest that your targeting would be improved and your rankings would be improved if you look where children live. I neglected to mention, so we do look at population of individuals under 18 years old when we are identifying our equity communities. And um, that is not what was reported at the post agenda because I, re I remember because I specifically asked and I was told that was okay. not happening. So I would love to follow up with you about that. I, I'm very happy if that is true, uh, but it's inconsistent with what was told to me by Domi's data person earlier this year. Um, so I would love, I would love to know that that was true and to have that confirmed. And then so back to the bill in front of us. How is um, the receipt of these grants, which is fantastic, and congratulations and thank you. Um, how, how does that work with what is going on with the data and the prioritizations, and how will this help? So the high injury network, which we identified looking at the, some of the data that you're describing, part of that is going to be the focus of the work of this grant. So we'll be building on what we've already identified as high need corridors where the vast, vast majority of our serious and fatal injuries are occurring. Um, and this is the opportunity for us to actually advance design on those corridors so that we can identify what the right fixes are to make them safer. Great, great. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I look forward to hearing whether or not, you know, how the rankings are being scored, even if you wanna kind of just send me the, the data tables or something like that, whatever's easiest. Right, I appreciate that. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman Kale Smith, followed by Councilwoman Warwick. Thank you. I just, um, I'll be real brief. I just want to first thank you. I think Domi has one of the hardest jobs. Um, I, I, all of our, everyone has a difficult job at working in the city of Pittsburgh, and I appreciate all of the, all the people. Even though sometimes it sounds like I'm tough, it's because I do know that our residents have concerns, but I do appreciate what you do. But I want to say that it's, with Domi, no matter what you do, People complain if you don't do something. People complain if you do do something. And so I just want to say thank you to you and your amazing team for they've been very helpful um, to a lot of a lot of things in our district. Um, my what I would say is when you're doing the ranking, ten projects there could be one per district and maybe one for cent another one for central downtown or central district. 
an additional one there or something. I just think that there's it has to be divided evenly. I, I think geographically there should be some some diversity um, in making sure that we're reaching areas that actually need help across the city of Pittsburgh. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councilperson Warwick. Um, yeah, thanks. So, um, as far so you mentioned uh, the crash data. I know that as part of the Vision Zero, sort of, you know, needs like the things that we need to be better with. It was um, getting communications from from public safety about crashes. Is that happening? I'll have to follow up on on that with you. I know that there are. Um, talks about how maybe we can use 911 data, for example, for near mm -hmm. misses because maybe 911 gets called because someone mm -hmm. witnesses something, but then it doesn't meet the threshold for reporting to the PennDOT database. Mm -hmm. So we've had those conversations, but I would have to get back to you on where we are with those. Okay, yeah, because sometimes it's like, you know, you, you request whatever, whether it's a stop sign or this or that, and, and, and you'll get back that says, oh, there's no crash data, but then knowing that we aren't really we don't have a mechanism yet for collecting that crash data that's consistent, you know. And, and again, like, I think a collaboration with public safety would be great if there was some way to, you know, if there's any kind of wreck, whether fatal or otherwise, that it gets logged and somehow, you know, that information gets back to Domi. Um, then the other thing I want to ask, so this, where the, the Vision Zero Focus Complete Streets Design Manual, um, is that so we, we've talked a little bit about, I mean, one of the issues with traffic calming is that speed humps are, you know, they take time, they're expensive, right? You've got to design them. Uh, you know, the des well, the design takes time. So um, if we're thinking about, and I know that we've talked in our, in our calls just about sort of, you know, piloting things that residents can do, whether that's with encroachment permits or maybe temporary speed hump. Or so is that is that something that we're going to be using this money to kind of look at? Because that would be, it would be great if there were ways that we can do small things in the smaller residential streets where we aren't ready yet to, to you know, where we're, where the high injury network is where we're looking at like the big projects, right? The speed humps, your, your flex posts and that kind of thing. But some option for, for neighborhoods to, to kind of slow cars down. I think that's Hopefully. definitely an opportunity. Um, you know, one of our challenges is that not all of our streets are different, right? And so the one treatment that's gonna work on a residential street, like you're saying, is not the right thing for a major arterial where we've got tens of thousands of cars every single day. Mm -hmm. The Complete Streets Design um, Guide is an opportunity to sort of have a map and say, what type of street is this? And therefore, mm -hmm. what are the right designs that would be appropriate for this type of street? So yeah. definitely. Okay, thank you, that's all. Thank you. Any further discussion? Councilman Mosley. Yeah, th thank you for uh, coming here today, Director uh, Lucas. Um, my, my first question is, um, have these 10 high injury quarters already, uh, you know, been determined or is it the hope of, you know, this um, legislation to begin an audit to identify what those are? So we have the high injury network, which has been identified, but the 10 specific corridors to advance and design through this grant have not yet been identified. And that's something where we're going to look at the crash severity, population, demographics, and things like that. Okay, and and um, and do you and do you have a sense of what you know these three demonstration projects would be? With, are they different from you know other interventions that we already do to calm traffic, or would these be like new innovative approaches? That's a great question. I think the idea is that they'd be new innovative approaches. I know we're looking at a community ambassadors program, so a little bit on the communication side as well to help increase safety awareness. Yeah, and um, and, and just from you know your your expertise, you know what are uh, kind of best practices that you're seeing, you know, from from other cities that are struggling, um, you know, with, with the need to calm traffic. You know, you know, throughout their metropolitan areas, like you know, what what kind of models are, are, are you drawing from? You know, outside of you know this specific piece of legislation as well, sure. just in your general work. So, in some places where they have gotten the number of people killed on their streets down to zero, of which there's only two places um, in the last year or two, things like templated approaches. You know, and this one, which was a one square mile community in New Jersey, 
they said, okay, at every single intersection, we're going to have this treatment that makes it so people cannot park right next to the intersection and thus increase visibility for people crossing the street. And so with a complete street design guide, which we hope to get over the finish line through this grant, there's an opportunity to develop those templates or at least recommendations so that we can hopefully implement a lot faster than what we're able to do today. And my final question, what do you see um, the role that uh, Carnegie Mellon University is, is going to play in this project as well? So they're developing um, a technology to sort of collect data at intersections and be able to make better recommendations for what a safety improvement would be based on some of that predictive information that they can they can collect. So we're really grateful that we were able to find a partner to work with us on this. As you know, finding match money, finding straight cash to be able to go after grants is sometimes a challenge. So by being able to work with them and, and have a more sophisticated data collection process, um, we're able to get more money in for the city. All right. Well, th thank you for your time. Thank you. That's Any you, further Chair. first round? Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Bill 982, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Affirmative recommendation. Thank, thank you, you very director. much, Director. I will propose that we move back up to interdepartmental transfers. We have um, guests from INP here. We have a motion on the table to approve with discussion. So if you'd like to join us, thank you very much for coming down. You're in trouble. Okay. You brought it up. <laughs> I was asking you. No, I didn't. I just asked him what it was. Good morning. Please introduce yourselves. And um, the question on the table is, uh, regarding the $200,000 from telephone to computer maintenance to cover the cost of ESRI contract and other unbudgeted expenses. I'm Jackie Rowden. I'm the assistant director uh, in IP and um, acting director while Heidi's out of, out of town. And I'm Gwen Moore, assistant director, business technology with IMP. Thank you. And I think your question is, what are the unbudgeted expenses besides ESRI? If you can just explain as ESRI and the unbudgeted expenses, the whole reason for the transfer, please. Mm -hmm. We have a list of items. So some of the unbudgeted expenses are no before, which is part of our security suite, E plus bulk services agreement, which is a support for our computer network, a CDW agreement for Azure overage, and that's for different um, uh, cloud storage, cloud. cloud storage that we have that's uh, that's billed monthly as opposed it's under contract, but it's billed monthly as opposed to a one-time annual fee because it's based on the actual storage. Microsoft SQL Server tr true up, which is our Microsoft SQL Server true up. We have it budgeted, but then it's trued up every year, and that's for the true up difference. The Cisco line cards for core switches. The first street request for factor data. I'm not familiar with that one, I'm sorry. Uh, FedTech IT staffing and utilization study. We have a consultant doing a study on our, um, our uh, I'm sorry, our technical, technical positions. our technical positions to verify the, um, the qualifications for the individuals and the, um, the, the average salary. We also have solution for networks. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that one, are you? They're doing a, a review of our uh, identity management. Do we have an RFP for network support? Center for, Center for Network Security, our Albert Monitoring, which is another part of our security, our CDW Dropbox. I'm not familiar with that one, are you? But in, but in general, Gwen, we, we, um, we have a number of unbudgeted items. Yes. And, and I think the specific question on the table is a transfer of $200,000 to to, specifically to cover ESRI, the ESRI cost. Um, and the question is, where is the money coming from? Is that the? Well, it's the coming from our I, telephone. Um, our, we have a telephone budget that we're not spending, and we're transferring the money from the telephone budget to cover mm -hmm. the unbudgeted expenses, which we've already incurred. Um, obviously, we have a list here, but if you need more detail, we'd be happy to get you more detail to tell you exactly what those items are going to and the exact amount. So one question is, why um, are these unbudgeted expenses? Are you able to speak to that? Why, why were these, these in particular not budgeted for? 
You want to talk specifically about Esri, Gwen? Can you talk about that one? I can't talk specifically about Esri except to say that we have an Esri contract that's a multi-year contract, and it came in a little bit higher than it would have ordinarily. We also have some additional services that they're providing for us, and Esri is used by our GIS uh, group. We, as you know, we've had multiple requests from council as well as from the mayor's office for GIS data in the various initiatives that you are covering, and some of those expenses were not um, included in our original budget. And, and I would just uh, add the same for the bulk, the, the um, majority, in fact, probably all of our unbudgeted expenses is that it, when we budgeted in June and July of 2023, we did not foresee some of these costs things like uh, some equipment required for us to move some of the data from the sixth floor, which as I think everybody knows is problematic, both in terms of environment, power supply, things like that, um, to, a Nova, to a space at Nova Place. And there are some items that we didn't anticipate needing for that move, that's the line cards that Gwen just mentioned. Um, we have, uh, uh, as you probably are aware, there have been some other municipalities that have had security breaches. As a result of those security breaches, we, we are taking some lessons from them um, for example, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we are saying, what do we need to do to harden some of our uh, security um, vulnerabilities? One of those is our identity, our email identities. And as you may be aware, we've had a couple of email addresses compromised at the city this year. So we have um, we have an identity. Some of yours. <laughs> we have an, some of yours. Yep. And we so we have we have out we have asked a consultant called Solutions for Networks. It's a, a women-owned um, company here in Pittsburgh to help us assess some of our security security vulnerabilities. We didn't anticipate that in July of 2023. So the unbudgeted expenses are, I would say, without exception, things that have come up in the intervening one to one year to 18 months. The specific transfer, and I apologize that Gwen and I weren't uh, weren't aware that we were on the docket here today so I apologize for that we'd be happy to answer specific questions and become and come back uh, prepared next week as well as provide you more information in the interim so as not to catch you unprepared as well thank you very much for, for that full answer I want to note councilperson Charland um, had um, the initial questions here so are there any further questions that you have and then councilwoman gross no I guess I mean, I think this is a little bit unusual to do expenditures this mm -hmm. way, um, but I, you know, I understand the the need for it. it. And I guess this is maybe kind of a question for the body: Is there a better way to do these expenditures? I'm as opposed to an interdepartmental transfer. We, when we develop our budget, we usually develop our budgets in June, and yeah. then, as you know, they're submitted in October. Um, and many times we try to project what is needed. So we, pro we over projected for our telephone budget and we under projected for our security suite. We under projected for Esri. So we cannot perfectly identify exactly what some, something's gonna cost. We put in the contract where we think it may be, but we can't always anticipate what some of the other additions are. So each year we do have some unbudgeted ex, uh, expenses and we transfer those from an account, an IMP account that has money in it so that we don't come back to you and ask for more money because we know we can't do that. Okay. Um, that's all I have. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilwoman Gross. Thank you. I'm just, uh, I got lost a little bit listening there, but I think I've found my way back. So this is just going from one IMP budget line to another IMP budget line. That's correct. correct. And I feel like I've seen thousands of these in my 10 years on council. Yes. In fact, when I first got to council, there weren't even budget lines that small and specific yes. in city budgets at all. Um, so this is a lot more transparency than we had maybe 10 years ago. Um, and I feel like these kinds of approvals are there just so that we can know um, what is going on and the public can know what is going on. But uh, I'm entirely comfortable with what's going on. And so um, it might be helpful to see again, because that was just so much information all at once. If you wanted to send it over to us an email, that might be helpful mm -hmm. or something. Um, but again, this is just going from a very, very specific, and I'm just gonna read this because the members of the public also, you can see this in the legislative packet, but it's like, it's going from the INP budget line 103000.55201, and just for note, in database systems, when you get more and more specificity, you get longer and longer and longer kind of row numbers, right? And then transferring it from that one to 
1030.53509. So thank you for letting us know. Um, and I trust that this will be better use in the new budget line than it was in the other one. So thank you. That's thank you. Too. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of interdepartmental transfers, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. And thank you and very good job thank last you. minute coming down. I really appreciate all the so information. Thank God for cell phones and being able to access the system. <laughs> <laughs> And um, have nice woman growth. Thank I, you. I'll you follow too. up with you on the detail that you asked for. Uh, that moves us on to apologies. Thank you. Land Use and Economic Development Committee, chaired by Councilman Wilson. Defer paper, Bill 525, ordinance amending the Pittsburgh Code, Title IX Zoning, Article 1, Section 902.03 Zoning Map, by changing from R1A VH, residential single unit attached, very high density district to LNC, local neighborhood commercial, on property roughly bounded by Hamilton Avenue, Dumfrum Lawn Street, Tioga Street, Cinnabar Way, and Zenith Way, all in the Allegheny County block and lot system, 13th Ward. A motion to hold for public hearing. Second. Question? Seeing none, all those in favor of a hold for public hearing, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Bill will be held for public hearing. That moves us on to Bill 749. Bill 749, resolution authorizing the mayor and the director of the Office of Management and Budget to enter into an agreement or agreements with Auberly for services relating to non-congregate shelter services related to the home ARP program for a total not to exceed $1,500,000. Motion to hold four weeks. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of four week hold, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Moves us on to new papers, Bill 983. Bill 983, resolution approving a conditional use application under the Pittsburgh Code, Title IX Zoning, Article 5, Chapter 911, Section 91104A22, to the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Pittsburgh property owner for authorization to conduct an excavation, grading, fill, major use at 1096 Goodman Street, parcels 129F1 and 129J150, zoned RP, residential plan unit developments, 14th Ward, Council District 5. Is there a motion? Second. This needs to be held for public hearing. Oh, yes. Motion to hold for public hearing. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of holding Bill 983 for public hearing, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Bill will be held for public hearing. Bill 985. Bill 985. Resolution providing for the designation as a historic structure under Title 11 of the Code of Ordinances that certain site known as Pittsburgh Stained Glass Studio, located at 160 Warden Street in the West End in the 20th Ward, City of Pittsburgh. The owner of the property supports the nomination and there is no cost to the city. Motion to hold for public hearing. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of hold, held for holding Bill 985 for public hearing, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Bill be held for a public hearing. That moves us on to Innovation Performance Asset Management and Technology Committee, chaired by Councilwoman Gross. Bill 1008, Resolution Amending Resolution 638 of 2024, effective September 24th, 2024, which authorized the mayor and the city solicitor to enter into a professional services agreement or agreements with Matrix Point Software, LLC, in an amount not to exceed $310,000 over six years for software, professional support, and related training services related to litigation case management for the city's law department by updating the applicable code account. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Bill 1008, please indicate by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Affirmative recommendation, new papers, Bill 971. Bill 971, Resolution Amending Resolution 764 of 2023, which authorized the City of Pittsburgh to extend a professional service agreement with STR Grants, LLC, 
for software services relating to the eProperties Plus profiling system by extending the term by one year at an additional cost not to exceed $57,391.83. Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Bill 971, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Affirmative recommendation. That moves us on to Intergovernmental and Educational Affairs Committee, chaired by Councilman Mosley. Bill 972, resolution authorizing the mayor and the director of the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure on behalf of the city of Pittsburgh to enter into an agreement or agreements with the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority to reimburse expenses of PWSA incurred for Blockstone to create to concrete street conversion performed by PWSA for the restoration yes. in Elliott yes, Project and an amount not to exceed $322,935.09. Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Bill 972, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Affirmative recommendation. Thank that you, That brings us to the end of our regular, uh, our standing committee's agenda. We have some meeting announcements. This afternoon at 2.30 p.m., council will hold a briefing on neighborhood economic development funding. Thursday, October 10th, Council will hold a Cablecast public hearing on Bill 2024-221 as it relates to zoning map changes on Shady Avenue. Registration closes at 12.30 p.m. the day of the hearing. Next week, Council will hold their regular meeting and standing committee's meeting on Tuesday, October 15th and Wednesday, October 16th, 10 a.m. respectively. Council registration will close at 9 a.m. the morning of each meeting. To register to speak at these meetings and hearings, please fill out the sign-up form at the council meeting webpage by the deadlines. You may also call the clerk's office at 412-255-2138. Anything from members? Seeing none, can I please have a motion to excuse the absent members, approve the minutes, and adjourn the meeting? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Meetings adjourned.